Welcome everyone to the May 2023 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. I'm your host, Jeremy Veldman. Got another excellent program for you guys tonight. We've got fellow MAS member, Conrad Sanders, who's gonna tell us about his plans for astronomy when he's in retirement. And that would actually be the Minnesota Astronomical Society, one of the largest astronomical societies in the country. So good to do a little benchmarking. So stay tuned for that program, should be pretty interesting. But before we get started, just a few preliminaries. First of all, again, we're the Memphis Astronomical Society. We're a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education and astronomy and related sciences. The best way to find us is on our website, memphisastro.org. We're also on Facebook. And again, if you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to this YouTube channel. And if you go to our website, if you're not on our email list already, just click the join button in the upper right or the lower right, and it'll take you to a separate form, fill out your details that way, and we'll put you on our email list. And again, we, we send emails out pretty frequently about upcoming events, whether it's meetings like this or observing events, if it's clear. So that's the best way to stay in contact with us. If you're interested in outreach services, and we had several of these questions last night at one of our events, there's also a form for that on our website. You go to contact, schedule talks and or telescopes, and there's a pretty detailed form there. Just give us as much information as you can, whether you're looking for a presenter and or people to come out with their telescopes. We do this a lot around town, whether it's for special groups, libraries, schools, um, just any special interest group. So that's the best way to engage us. If you're if you're looking for outreach, just fill out that form. We have an outreach committee that will get you scheduled when, um, at, at our next availability. And then also hopefully when it's clear. Calendar of events, happy Cinco de Mayo. Um, I don't know if that's something you guys celebrate, but we're getting into the month of May now. We have a few things coming up. Our, well, tomorrow night, if it's clear, we will be at Pinecrest Camp in Moscow, Tennessee. It does look like it's going to be clear. I am planning to be out there. I've got a few other people as well. So if you're looking to get out, it's been a rough month weather-wise, feel free to go out, take your telescope for this event. It's kind of a nature event also. Uh, you can check out more details on their website. But we'll make the official go, no-go call tomorrow morning. But even if it's partly cloudy, we are planning to be out there. So again, if you're interested in get out, that's May 6th, tomorrow night, Pinecrest Camp. Two weeks away is our next dark sky observing event at Burton Sugar Farm. And again, that's our dark sky site. It's about 45 minute drive due east from Memphis. Had a rough couple of months again with, with, with uh, clear skies, but hopefully as we get into the month of May, we'll get a little bit better string of good luck. So uh, if you're looking to get out again under dark skies, uh, mark your calendars for May the 20th. And then the following Friday, May the 26th, we'll be at Bobby Lanier Farm Park in uh, Germantown. And May the 27th, that's the Saturday before Memorial Day, we have another special event coming up. And we've had a lot of requests, not only for observing, but for telescope mentoring. And that's what we're planning to do at Hinton Park in Collierville on May the 27th. So if you just bought a telescope or if you need some assistance learning how to use your telescope and get a little bit more one-on-one -on -one hands-on help from some of our experienced members, mark your calendar for that date. That's Saturday, May 27th, Hinton Park right here in, in, in uh, Collierville. It's a nice location. I'm, I haven't been out there at night, but uh, there are facilities there. It seems like a fairly wide open space and we will have some experienced MAS members on hand. Of course, it is Memorial Day weekend, so we'll see who's available. But anyway, that is a date to circle on your calendar if you're looking for some telescope mentoring. And we're hoping to do this more frequently, you know, as the year progresses, offer this service to people. And we've, we've gotten a lot of these requests lately. So. Saturday, May 27, Hinton Park, telescope mentoring and observing. Mark your calendars. All right, kind of another bad string of, or another string of bad luck this past month. Unfortunately, Village Creek didn't work out. 
We did have this event last night. A couple of us were at the Scouters Trade Show right here in town. And we had a table kind of promoting MAS and our services, as well as several others. So that's about all that we've done in the, in the, in the past month since our, our past meeting. So, and when we were at this event, I did want to make you aware of an update on the solar eclipse for next year. And of course, that's April the 8th, 2024. Many of you are aware of that date. For those of you who are not, this is a date you're going to want to circle on your calendar. That's the next total solar eclipse that's coming to the United States of America. Of course, you can see the, the path of totality. But the Scouts are having this event at uh, Kayakima Park or a Kayakima Scout Troop um, near Hardy, Arkansas. And it's kind of a weekend event. So combination of observing and then some other activities, April 6 and 7. And then the idea is you wrap up with the eclipse. So this is kind of our plan A. They have invited us, uh, assuming we you know, come out and show up in a good mood and bring telescopes and help out. So something to be thinking about if you're looking for, for plans for next year's solar eclipse. And as far as location, you can kind of see here on the map where it is, very northern part of Arkansas, again, just northwest of Hardy. And you can see here, it's about four minutes and nine seconds of duration during totality. So it's very good, very close to the max duration, not too far from the center line. And I am planning to check this out next month if we get a, if we get a good day. But uh, they do have, you know, facilities. It's camping, right? You're, you come out to this a day or two earlier. You're bringing a tent or car camping or something like that. They do have some cabins available, but they're filling up pretty quick. But if it's clear, Monday, April the 8th, this is where we're planning to be. And again, totality occurs uh, just before two o'clock in the afternoon, central daylight time, looks like. And we were clear this year for whatever that's worth. So it means basically absolutely nothing compared to next year, but it does mean that there is some hope. So anyway, if you're looking for an option for next year's solar eclipse, you know, keep this in mind. Uh, we certainly will keep this in mind as well as our primary plan for next year's solar eclipse. We'll send out more information on this as we get closer to the date. But I just kind of want to make you aware that we are thinking about this. And if it's clear, then that's our plan A. And you know how it goes. A few days before, we check the forecast, and then it's man overboard, every man, woman, and child for themselves. And we're all kind of scrambling along the path to find the clearest skies that we can. But Hopefully it'll be like this and we can all meet there next year, the Kaikima Boy Scout Camp. So anyway, want to welcome some of our new members. Joe LaSala, recently approved from California, found us online, happy to have you aboard. And Robert Hasselmeyer, he has been on our, on our list for a while and he's uh, been associated with MAS for several years recently donated uh, an OTA optical tube and amount to our group. So thank you, Robert, for your donation. And we're very happy again to have you on board as a member. And again, if you're a member, check out the Meteorite. And um, we have a write-up about our June program coming up. So I just wanna remind everybody of that meeting as well. It'll be in person at Rhodes College and yeah, I'm just looking at a comment here. Fly fishing time around Hardy. So you definitely want to re make your reservation. Yeah, exactly. So if you're planning on Hardy, Arkansas for the eclipse, you're going to want to make your reservations now because I'm sure it will fill up pretty fast. So um, anyway, check out this, this, this month's edition of the Meteorite. And June the 2nd. All right, so we're meeting virtually tonight. Our next in-person meeting will be June the 2nd at Rhodes College. Same location, Robertson Hall, room 110. We do have a special guest speaker coming in town from Arkansas. And he's planning to do a program on the moon. And then if it's clear, we'll have an observing session out on the lawn afterwards. So June, school's out, summer's just beginning. Hopefully we'll have clear skies, favorable conditions. 
And this looks like a pretty interesting program. So we want to get the word out ahead of time and hopefully we'll be planning for that. So we got Dr. Daniel Barth, Arkansas State University. So make plans to come out, bring your telescope if you'd like. <clears throat> and uh, again, if you need some assistance with your scope, this might be a good opportunity, but a uh, combination of presentation and observing afterwards. And again, we'll send out more notices about this as well. And reminder, Slack is another way that you can engage with us. If you're a member, we will send a, an email link out, an updated link out to our members. The link expires every 30 days, but uh, this is a, it's another way that, that uh, you can stay involved and, and get your questions answered or just basically engage with our group. And the next Memphis Astrophotography group meeting will be May the 17th. And again, you do have to be a member to participate in this, in this group, but uh, the Mass Fits are, are doing some pretty interesting things, and you can check out their previous meetings on our YouTube channel. Last April, Freddie did an intriguing presentation on observing or photo, uh, photographing the sun, and it might be interesting and useful for next year's eclipse. So you can jump in anytime, all levels of experience. It's a great way to learn this hobby and get mentored by some of the best out there. So, and we do have a form on our website for that as well. But again, if you're part of this group or if you'd like to be May the 17th, mark your calendar. That is our next meeting of the Memphis Astrophotography Focus Group. And I didn't know this, but it's not only Cinco de Mayo, but it's actually National Space Day. I did not even know there was a National Space Day, but I thought I'd mention this. Did you know that National Space Day is an annual holiday that falls on the first Friday in May? The holiday celebrates the wonders and mysteries of our universe. Have you found yourself contemplating space on a slightly more down to earth level? Whether upsize, downsize, or simply right size, my time and I is ready to help you. Okay, I've done some business with Del Mar. I'm not necessarily promoting them. If you're looking for a lender for real estate, check them out. But I got this email and I thought, huh, Space Day, interesting. So that's why I'm sharing it. So happy Cinco de Mayo and also happy Space Day. All right, I wanted to show you guys this as well. This is NGC 4565. That's the Needle Galaxy, one of our favorite deep sky targets this time of year. And this is an image that one of our former members took a few years ago, Keith, Keith Latule. And Great, great object, whether you're doing astrophotography or observing visual. So yeah, favorite this time of year under dark skies. But for those of you who subscribe to Sky and Telescope Magazine, they did a write-up on this particular object. And I wanted to mention that because this kind of reminds me of what my worldview is when it comes to telescope and why I'm a big Dob guy, a Dobsonian guy. And I thought this was a very intriguing article by Howard Banish. So you can see here kind of a zoomed in picture of the needle and obviously a lot more details than what you would see with a, a smaller, even medium sized telescope. But if you zoom in here in this box, um, to the upper left here is kind of a, a blown up portion of this image. You see these two very faint smudges and you don't necessarily see those in, in Keith's image. And this is a pretty detailed image, but it's hard to pull that out. Um, but anyway, if you zoom in here, you're actually looking at other galaxies and they're very far away and they're very faint. And it turns out the galaxy inside of this circle is uh, NGP9 F378-0021738. I know that's a mouthful, but uh, again, you would need a pretty large telescope to pull this out, at least 45, 46 inches, probably a 50 inch telescope. Howard, when he wrote this article, I think he used a 48 inch under really dark skies and you know, pretty good seeing conditions. But anyway, I point that out because obviously this is a galaxy and I have to look up how far away it is, several million light years. But this galaxy here, the light travel time is over a billion years. And that just blows my mind. 
that he's able to see light that's been traveling for over a billion years in the eyepiece of, of, of one of his telescopes. Or it's not his, it's a friend of his telescope. So in this case, a 48 inch. So, and he observed that a year ago, April of 2022. So check out that article in Sky and Telescope from this month, May, 2023. Really fascinating. Um, I am planning to be at the Texas Star Port party next week, week after next. And I don't know how large the scopes are out there, but they do have the McDonald Observatory. But if I get an opportunity with a big mirror, I would love to check this out. You know, my small 20 inch probably ain't gonna get it done. But, uh, you know, if you're a big Dob guy like me, these galaxies here, very far away in this group right here, a billion light years. And then he talks about these down here in box number one, light travel time over two, two billion light years away. So that would be amazing to experience at a dark sky. Like study. aperture envy sitting in. <laughs> well, again, everybody has a different worldview. So. I don't know. Probably not going to get this with a six inch. So <laughs> anyway, just want to point that out. Check out that article. Howard, thank you. That's an excellent article. Okay. Tonight's program, we want to welcome fellow MAS member, Conrad Sanders, and that's the Minnesota Astronomical Society. I do have a trivia question for you guys before I introduce our speaker. All right. The Mississippi River runs through Baton, Lu uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That's a capital city, the capital of Louisiana. Can somebody tell me what other capital city the Mississippi River runs through? I'll give you a second. St. Paul, Minnesota. Bill, thank you. <laughs> that would be St. Paul, Minnesota. It's actually, I think, the headwaters of the Mississippi River. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, our speaker tonight is not far from there, and he is a member of the Minnesota Astronomical Society, one of the largest astronomical societies in the country. They've done some exciting things and given us an opportunity to copy some of what they're doing to make our club better. And he got into astronomy a few years ago. He's getting ready to retire, and he's been fairly active not only in their group, but also on the Astro Imaging channel. So he's got a pretty interesting presentation tonight. It's never, never too late. It's better late than never to get started in this hobby astronomy. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a warm welcome to our presenter, Mr. Conrad Sanders. Conrad, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I was just gonna add to your, your trivia with the Mississippi River. Um, it actually, it starts in Northern Minnesota, believe it or not. Um, and, and it comes down through St. Paul. Um, so yeah, it's it's actually very flooded right now. We have a lot of snow this winter, so um, it's just interesting. Let me start up my PowerPoint presentation. Thanks for having me. Um, get my PowerPoint up here. Share my screen in a minute here. Cancel. I don't want that. Okay. Move this out of the way here. And let me try this again to start this. Um, can you see my screen? Yep, we can see you fine. Just go to yep. slideshow. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have to get this over so I can see. There we go. I need to get over so I can see where to start the slideshow. Here we go. From beginning. Okay. How's that look? Can you see my, my front page here? Looks great. Okay. So, um, like Jeremy said, I, 
I, I gave this presentation to the Astro Imaging Channel um, last August, I believe. So um, this is just my presentation. Same presentation, I added a few new things to it. Um, since then, I've added some new equipment. So I'm just going to kind of go over, um, you know, my presentation here. And and I called this Better Late Than Never to Tackle Astronomy. Um, like I said, I started this and I'll get into it, how I, I decided to start doing this. Um, uh, but that's kind of where it all started. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, go to the next slide here. So um, I'm going to talk about um, my youth growing up, um, my education and my current employment, um, my other interests. I do have other interests besides astronomy, believe it or not. It's hard to juggle a lot of this stuff sometimes, but, uh, but I do like do do like to keep very active. Um, you know what got me interested uh, in astronomy. Um, I want to talk about um, my local county parks that I have uh, in my area. In fact, right across the road here, I have a great park um, that I use, and I find it very fortunate to. Even though I do live in the Twin Cities, I, I, I'm more further out, so um, I have darker skies out this way. So the parks make it really nice because I've got, uh, there's a lot of lakes and it opens up the sky for me. We'll talk about that. Um, how I got into astro imaging, I started out doing visual and then um, went down the rabbit hole with imaging. And of course, I want to talk about our MAS, the Minnesota Astronomy Society. Um, we have about 650 members. So we're a large, large organization. We just had our meeting last night, believe it or not. So we, we, we meet the first Thursday of every month. And we do, um, we do dial-in um, since COVID, but then we also meet in person. And I like to go in person if I can, because then we go out for a couple of beers afterwards, it's kind of fun. Um, and then uh, my backyard, the equipment that I use, and I thought I'd share a few of my astro images with you guys. And then uh, questions, and I'll, I'll have some final questions at the end, but if you want to stop me anytime, you feel free to interrupt me. I don't have a problem with that. So. Um, as long as it's fresh in your mind, it's best just to let me know right away if, if you have a question and I'll stop. Okay. So I'm going to talk about um, my youth. Um, I spent my early years uh, born in Bozeman, Montana. Um, and, and then I, I uh, moved to North Dakota, Western North Dakota. Um, that's where I spent my, you know, my early years. And then uh, I've always been interested in space. Um, I started the hobby of mile rocketry. I lived in North Dakota, um, joining the National Association of Rocketry. And uh, I was really fascinated with this hobby. Um, I just have a few examples of some rockets I actually, actually built. These are fairly large rockets. Uh, the, the one, the, the one next to the, the NAR logo is the uh, the V2 a Pershing missile, um, and then the Mercury Redstone and the Saturn V. And I, I I would take these and I would use some very large engines um, to to shoot these off. So um, that's what I was really interested in um, when I was younger. But, but but it's funny living in North Dakota. You think I'd be interested in astronomy? Well, I don't. I don't think I could afford it for one thing, but but uh, it's it's very. The skies are amazing back there. It's very dark, um, and like I said, I wasn't interested in astronomy. So um, it took me all these years to decide that I wanted to get into this this hobby. So let's go to the next one. Um, <clears throat> my education, my first computer job. I graduated from high school in 1976. I went to the North Dakota State College of Science for computer operations. And back then, computers were mainframes. There weren't no, there weren't no PCs 
PCs came out in 1980, so I was doing this before. And uh, my first job was working at a mainframe data center uh, in Minot, North Dakota. And then I uh, decided to move to Minnesota in 1978 to work for a company called Jostens. And if you know Jostens, they're the big Super Bowl ring company. Um, that's where I went to work. It was in a town uh, called Owatonna, and it's about an hour south of the Twin Cities. And I am currently employed um, by a national bank. And I'm responsible for networking and the cloud computing on the mainframe. So I just want to show you a picture here that when I started in this in the mainframe, the computers looked kind of like this icon here with the with the tape drives and and uh, you know we took up floors of equipment and technology has evolved now where everything looks like this now. It's just incredible. There are no tape drives and it's just changed so much. Um, I've been doing this for about 45, 45 years. And it's just it's uh, it's just really changed over the years. Um, so that's what I that's currently kind of the environment I work in. Um, I currently reside in St. Paul, um, actually a suburb called Egan, Minnesota, which is just south of St. Paul. And my Bortle, my sky is a six here. I get about a twenty one reading on my my sky SQM meter. So oh, it's not bad when you think the cities is usually around or eight or nine if you're in the cities. Um, some of my hobbies include uh, road cycling, cross country and downhill skiing, hiking, and of course now astronomy. And um, I said I was getting close to retirement. I decided that it was time for a new hobby because I didn't want to get into retirement. And, and, and uh, even though I'm, I, I'm active with other things, I wanted something that kept my mind um, active and I thought the astronomy would be a good thing. So um, I'm currently an active board member of the Minnesota Astronomy Society. I am finishing up my, probably my last term. I'm a board member at large and um, uh, I'm gonna probably, I'm gonna, not gonna run next term to give somebody else a chance, but it's just a few photos of the things I'd like to do. Um, um, up in the left hand corner, that was up in uh, um, Alaska, hiking up the mountains, and then my my road cycling um, out here, out in Lake Tahoe, and Nevada skiing, hiking in northern Minnesota, downhill skiing in Lake Tahoe, and then uh, a very snowy snowy uh, um, site there on the right hand corner with my brother in law skiing out in Lake Tahoe. Okay, so. How did I get started? Okay, so I get a, I get a Sunday paper that I read, and there's a life section in that newspaper. And over here is a little clip from Mike Lynch, who actually lives in Egan. He's he lives about five miles from me, but he was a famed meteorologist in the Twin Cities, WCCO AM radio. And he had, would, would have this article in the paper um, every Sunday about astronomy. And that's where I got my interest. I, I start reading his article and I thought, hmm, that sounds something I wanna do. So I, I, I credit Mike Lynch, who was in our astronomy club too, by the way, um, of getting me started in this, but I didn't know him. Um, but he has since been out uh, to my house um, once he wants to come out again next month uh, to, to work on some stuff with Nina together. Um, so he he goes out to Arizona quite a bit. He is he's retired, and so based on what Mike Lynch was telling me, I decided I was going to. I ordered a Celestron Evolution from Star Arizona down in Tucson, which I'm sure you folks probably heard of Star Arizona. They're the, the makers of the Hyperstar, and then I joined the the Minnesota Astronomy Society because I felt um, that was important for me to, to, to get come up to speed about astronomy and learn from others. So I have been a member for at least five years now, maybe six. Um, so that's how I got interested, just by reading an article in the newspaper. Um, so my initial journey was strictly doing visual. That's all I was interested, just excited to get my, my first scope out visually. And of course, 
the timing wasn't very good because it was in February when I started to decide to do this. And February is very cold in Minnesota, so uh, we get a lot of snow. Um, but I was so excited, I, I didn't care. I didn't care if it was cold or snow. I was so excited to get my telescope out in my backyard. And uh, what I did, I, I I did do the initial alignment, you know, the manual alignment, but then I decided, you know, I got to get smarter about this. It's really cold outside. So I bought the Celestron Star Sense and I added it to my, my telescope so it would speed up the alignment. And plus, I didn't know the sky very well yet. So I didn't know all the sky with the stars. So I was just so anxious to get started. I wanted to save time. And then, of course, like I said earlier, I, I joined the MAS, um, Minnesota Astronomy Society. Um, um, you know, all the presentations, they would have presentations. We're a very active club. We have presentations every month for beginners, experts. We have imaging things for, for our imagers in the group to learn more, more and more. So that was very valuable. And here's just, I think this is the first winter I got my evolution. You can see me where I I uh, dug out a small path from my backyard and uh, dug out a little, a little hole there. And that's me imaging in the back. So that's true dedication, let me tell you. <laughs> And then uh, on the right, uh, I think I I think I was starting to get into uh, EAA. So if you're familiar with EAA, it's like electronic assisted astronomy. I was just starting to play around with that, um, and you and you sharp cap sharp cap uh, live stacking. Um, but I, I I started very basic, you know. And it was just it's just constantly growing. So um, my wife thought I was nuts, but I just. The adrenaline took over. I just was excited about it that I didn't care how cold it was. So everything was outside for me at first. And then um, that that year, um, we have a we have a um, our newsletter is called the Gemini. So it's the Minnesota Astronomy, Astronomical Society. I decided to write a story. Um, um, Similar to what I'm present, presenting to you guys, but this is a lot more detailed. This was just me when I first got into it. And so um, they're always looking for stories. So I decided to go ahead and publish a story in our newsletter. So, and I, I even put like a um, when, I shoot, when I shoot rockets, that's not me, but it's just a, an example of the model rocketry, how I started doing that um, with. Uh, um, shooting those rockets off. And then in 2018, the Twin Cities was awarded Alcon 2018. Not sure if any, get, any of you guys made it up for this, but uh, I had just joined the club. So I was pretty excited to have this conference. Basically, it was over by the Mall of America in Bloomington in my backyard, maybe 10 minutes from here. And to have all these people coming from all over the United States, uh, you know, to to Minnesota to have this um, this convention that we had Alcon. So, um, and it was kind of cool because we were able to um, showcase um, our observatories that we have, and I'll go over that later in detail of our different sites that we have. Uh, but our, our premier one is the, called the Eagle Lake Observatory in Baylor Regional Park, and and um, that's where we would have people come over, people come all over the country, and then go out after our our meetings during the day when we go out and do star parties at night. So um, uh, like I said, I had just joined the Maz. So this, this just came up right the first year I was in it. So I was overwhelmed by everything, but it was pretty cool to have this, you know, uh, in Minnesota. Just want to bring that up. Um, here's, uh, this is a little bit outdated, um, but I'm still on there yet, but this is our board, um, our board that we have. Um, and like I said, it's a little outdated. I didn't get a chance to update it yet, but uh, and that's our little logo at the top. We just celebrated our 50 year um, uh, anniversary um, last year, so it's pretty cool. And uh, I wasn't able to make that, but I think we had the guy from uh, oh, the astronomy. I can't think of the, the the guy's name. Alan was it something? Alan. His last name is Alan, but he he came and actually spoke at our. Um, um, our uh, our club meeting, so it's pretty cool to have him. 
And then I want to talk about uh, uh, the park system I mentioned earlier. Very, very fortunate to live to the park system that has fairly dark skies and open some, some open areas over the lakes. Um, the park is generous. They let me scope in the park after hours. So the park closes at 10 p.m. I have to be in the park right before 10 because the gates closed. So I, I'm in there and then I just let myself out at night when I leave, but just the gate opens up um, and the county issues me a permit. So the rangers do come around, but they know me pretty well. So they know that that's me out. They don't bother me. Any. At first they they would bother me. They'd come out and they'd shine their lights on me. And I didn't did really like that. I think they got the hint that they didn't like that because it was bothering my you know, when especially I was doing visually, it bothered my eyes, but uh, but now that they're, they're pretty used to it. Um, so that's just a few of the parks. My favorite, the, the Lebanon Hills to the left, that is right across the road from me here. And then um, this other uh, Whitetail Woods in the middle of it, that's, that's a little further out. And that's darker skies there. That's about uh, eight miles out from me. And then here's just a few photos of, of the, you can see how open the skies are. Um, you know, um, the picture on the left-hand corner here, that's actually like a little, uh, little mini amphitheater, but I set up right there and the, the lake is right there. Um, the power is not good, good there. I've had some trouble with the power, but this open field in the middle, they've got good power there. They have, uh, a big box there and I use that. And then sometimes I'll actually drive right. They let me drive in the sidewalks. I'll drive right through this, this opening and, uh, um, they're okay with that. They gave me the access to do that. So I have a really good relationship with them. And then this is the, this is Whitetail Woods. I mentioned that's eight miles from my house. And the nice thing what they have there, and I actually haven't used these yet, but they have these camper cabins and, you know, they're just a place to sleep. You know, um, the bathrooms are outside here, outside this building, but there's bunks in there. And facing out from these camper cabins, they get a beautiful view to the south and the skies are totally open. And you can see here's a picture right here that shows that, um, shows that uh, beautiful um, sky that you, you can look out and have access to, to all that. So, but I haven't stayed at these camper cabins. They're very popular. Um, but one of these days I'll get one of these. This other spot here, um, is where I would set up when I go to, out to Whitetail Woods. You can see there's a couple of power poles here. And uh, I set up, um, I set up right here. Now I have a story about that in a minute here about what happened there my first time. Um, so, so basically I went over to the park and I told them, you know, what I want to do. And, um, you know, we talked about star parties in the future, but, un but then unfortunately the COVID hit and we had to kind of put everything on hold. And so we never really picked up on after that, but I just want to let them know that, you know, I would be really interested uh, in using this park system, you know, uh, for, for, for everybody, the, the county residents and myself. Um, but, but unfortunately the lights go off at 11 PM and it's, it's a security thing. And so it's not the best in the parking lot to go scope out there. Um, you know, in the, in the summer, it's okay. You know, I don't really care in the summer, but the fall is really tough because you get the long night and for security, they keep the lights on until 11. So um, I also discussed the possibility of maybe uh, maybe an observatory. We could work with them with our club and, and for the park residents. And then getting to that story that about, about that Whitetail Woods, that area I showed you in that previous slide, I set up on that and I little did I realize that I set up right in the middle of a, uh, uh, automatic sprinkler zone. And so I set, I set everything up and all of a sudden about 11 o'clock and I hear this whooshing sound and my God, I said, the spray is going over my head. And I, I tried to turn them and then run over to my telescope equipment to move them. I, I got nothing got damaged, but I'll never forget that. And they forgot to tell me there was, that was a sprinkler zone. So I won't be setting up there anymore or finding out what days they don't do set, set the sprinkler on over there. But, um, you know, and I was wet too. So then the mosquitoes were all over me biting. The mosquitoes are terrible in Minnesota, but I was bit up, uh, just ate alive out there from those mosquitoes because it was all wet. But 
that was quite the experience. That was like my first year out there. Um, so I want to talk a little about the imaging, how the imaging bug kind of hit me. Um, after doing visual, I decided I really wanted to move on to deep sky imaging. So I started out very basic. I, I used a device called uh, the Revolution Imager. Um, they're out of California. And uh, it was like $300. And with that, I was doing EAA. So that was just basically... It really, what the revolution image is like a security camera, and it's like a TV cable, coax cables, very cumbersome. But I thought, you know, this is an easy way for me to start. And then I also heard about a company, our, uh, a place out in Tucson called Starzona, um, that had an, a hyperstar, which converted my scope from an F10 to an F1.9. And I thought, wow, that's crazy, you know, to have it that fast and. Uh, um, but I, the, the beauty of the Hyperstar, I was able to use my scope visually too, which I didn't want to give up. So um, even though the Hyperstar you have to take off, you can you can just quickly put it back into visual mode. And so I like that. So I scheduled a trip down to Tucson because um, I actually want to see this, this device to get a demonstration of a Hyperstar. And um, while I was down in Tucson, um, I brought my daughter with me. Um, we visited Kitt Peak. Um, and I don't know if you, anybody has been to Kitt Peak, but it's a phenomenal facility. Um, it was, it was, they had like two feet of snow that two weeks before we were there. You could still see snow in the mountains yet. But uh, I, I couldn't believe it, the number. Of, I thought I'd seen all the stars uh, living out in North Dakota, but I had not seen stars like this until I went to Tucson, Arizona. Um, and we went through a presentation, um, we went into one of their observatories, they let me look through their eyepiece, a very large telescope. So a very, very cool facility. And um, so Star Zona, what they do is they do, they used to anyway before COVID, I think they started up again, is every Friday night they set up in their parking lot. Um, and, and Tucson's got light pollution ordinance, so it's pretty dark there. And uh, they gave me a demonstration of Hyperstar. Um, and then I just I, at that point that I wanted to purchase the eight inch. Um, and they pretty much got this device ready for me over the weekend and I took it home with me. And then I purchased a ZWO uncooled planetary camera. And again, it was with cost. Um, I mean, people generally don't use planetary for, for uh, deep sky, but I thought, well, I could use it for planetary to get started, and I can use it for deep sky. It would work just fine. It was a, it was a color camera, and then, like I said, I was heavy into electronic assisted astronomy, doing live stacking um, for deep sky. And then the picture down here, this is the Revolution Imager. They still sell them. Not a good device for Minnesota in the winter time. These cables would crack, and it, it was just a cumbersome setup. And then, of course, the Hyperstar. And then my my ZWO uh, planetary camera, and this image here was the first image I ever took with the Hyperstar um, from stars from stars on a parking lot in Tucson, um, and I was pretty excited about that. So um, I was just blown away they could get this and uh, they could get the image like this, but they assisted assisted me in doing that. So, and then. Uh, I then eventually started, well, I got the planetary camera. Um, so then I thought I wanted to start doing planetary imaging. And, you know, seeing conditions are really tough in this state. We we don't get very good seeing conditions. It's not like we live like in Florida or South Carolina, you get the beautiful, uh, um, the sea conditions are incredible because the air is so steady. We get very few days like that here, but I was able to shoot Saturn um and jupiter um back in 2020 it looks like i did, did these so i was pretty excited so i was jumping from eaa right into planetary imaging and i thought okay well now what you know what's next and then here's a picture of, of the on the moon i with hyperstar i could fit the entire moon in in the, in the field of view and then i i decided to mark where apollo 11 land too it's it's close it's not perfect but um, 
And then some more planetary, uh, this is Mars. Um, back in 2020, when Mars was in opposition, um, I mean, I never expected to get any kind of detail from Mars, but when it's close to Earth, it, it, it really makes a difference. And then, and then Venus over here, um, kind of boring, but it's still kind of cool to try it. So, okay. And then I entered into the round, into the into the rabbit hole. I keep saying the rabbit hole, but that's what it is. Um, you know, to move into deep sky imaging. So um, I purchased a used Celestron CGX equatorial mount. Um, you know, at the time I probably didn't need that big of one, but I want something for growth. So I did get the CGX. And then, you know, things like PhD2, polar alignment, those are all great to me. So I had to do a lot of YouTubes and talk to a lot, a lot, a lot of my... Uh, my mates in my astronomy club, um, they, they were very helpful. Um, my astronomy budget easily doubled at that point. And then I started out using a program called APT, Astrophotography Tool. And then I would use the Celestron's CPWI software. And I was one of the early adopters of, of the CPWI. I was on the Celestron's beta team. There are a lot of problems with it for, at first, so I had to report a lot of issues, but but I was able to get it to work. And I liked it because I could use my PC uh, without using the hand control. And uh, the hand control does not work very well in 10 below weather in Minnesota. It just, it does not work. Um, so um, having that was nice. And then I decided, you know, APT is a great program, but then I heard about this program called NINA, and um, at the time, APT did do, do automatic, automatic focusing, and I wanted to start using automatic focusing. So I knew Nina had done that, um, and especially with Hocus Focus, which is the plugin that they have. And uh, that's, what I, that's why I had switched to Nina. And then I purchased for post-processing, I purchased PixInsight. Um, over very overwhelming to me at first. I, I thought it was so complicated, but um, I also purchased a program called Star Tools. The guys from Australia, good program, but just doesn't do as much that, that Pix Insight did. So I, um, I still have Star Tools, but my my choice is Pix Insight. And then I bought Affinity Photo um, because it's like Photoshop and it's a lot cheaper. But eventually, I gave in and I did buy Photoshop. Uh, so I use them both. I took training classes and then I become very active uh, with the Masters of Pix, Pix Insight. I'm sure you folks or imagers are aware of them. They have the sessions every um, month. Um, Warren Keller, um, Ron Breacher, all those folks. Um, you know, so I I'm very active in that, and I'm also on their um, um, MOP. I'm part of MOP too, and that's a subscription too, where they give you tips and hints. And that really helped me uh, pick up the post-processing stuff. And then I decided, well, you know, I've got a few other scopes. Why not get a solar scope? So um, I got a six, a Lund 16 millimeter solar scope. And I first, but before that though, I, I did start out with my uh, SCT doing white light, white light imaging. Um, um, but that didn't give me the HA. So I decided, uh, to uh, to go with the 60 and that mount down there in that picture that's a, that's an evolution it works very nicely it attracts the sun very well so um, that's what I currently use I just was out um, last week doing some solar imaging and the picture on the left is brand new I just did this last week um, with the full sun and they got the prominences and the sunspots and uh, I started to use a program called IMP, IMPGG, um, which works out very well. And then uh, this one on the right here was just a fluke where I just happened up. That bird actually flew in front of the sun and happened to catch it. So um, that was for that was from a Coronado that I took. So, and then uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Minnesota Astronomical Society. Um, um, what we do, this is uh, this picture to the right is me and looking at the Mars opposition at one of our, our out of our domes. This is a um, astrophysics month. 
um, the big telescope there, and uh, that, that's one of our really nice sites. Um, and then another site, um, which is probably my favorite, it's the, the Cherry Grove Observatory. It's closest to me, it's about an hour away. It's a Bortle Four sky. Um, this building used to sit on the university, I, I used to be 3M. 3M Minnesota, they used to have their, their, uh, their own astronomy club. And they eventually, before I was part of the club, they moved this down to, um, to Cherry Grove. It's about an hour and a half south of the Twin Cities. And we have a, we have a warming house. And then we got the roll off for right there. And, uh, and then the next picture here is we have a Star Master Dob. Um, they just built a new cart for that. We have a lot of Dob, Dob lovers in our club, so that's there are a lot of visual people that like that. So some just some amazing um, visual looking through that is, is amazing. And then here, this is a picture of me with um, the plane wave CDK 12.5 and the Takahashi. That mount on the top is not currently being used. The new mounts in the bottom right here. We replaced that mount with this one here. Um, so we've got some problems right now with the with the plane wave. We're trying to get the fo uh, focusing to work right. Our stars aren't quite working, but the Takahashi does some amazing things here. And then uh, and then we also have a a Mead uh, LX uh, SCT tutor for visual people that come down. And that's all housed in this building up on the top here. This with the roll off row. And then this is our premier site. This is where during Alcon we had um, everybody come out that came to the conference. Um, there's a there's there's a classroom in the middle here for people to come in for classes. Um, we have you know we have telescopes in, in here. We have a solar scope. Uh, you know and other I'll, I'll go over it with the actual inventory we have. It's called the Onan Observatory. That's about an hour west of the Twin Cities, and it's that's also a border with four sky there. Um, so yeah, the Sylvia Casby Observatory, the one up atop here, that houses the age uh, the TMB um, with the Takashi Mulan, three hundred uh, Dal Kirkham and a S SV one hundred two refractor, and it talks about the Ash Dome and. Uh, and then on this one here, we got the we got the astrophysics. Um, actually, that's the one that's up on the top here, isn't it? Um, but uh, you know, we have we have some pretty big scopes. This one, this one here has got just the Lund solar scope on it, and then uh, you know, quite some extensive uh, equipment at this site. And then uh, the one I had showed earlier with me was the JJ Casby Observatory. And that's got a 10 inch TMB F9 refractor um, with an astrophysics uh, El Capitan mount. And that's, that's, um, that's east of the Twin Cities, so. And then our really dark sky site is up in a place called Long Lake. It's a Bortle II sky in northern Minnesota, and uh, it's phenomenal. It's just phenomenally dark there. And we get together in August for a week. We have a big star party. We have an agreement with the Long Lake Conservation Center, the, the NAS group, that we can use their facilities for outreach and um, star parties and everything else. So this is coming up in August, and uh, we always um, we always hope and pray for nice weather because it is a Bortle II sky. And I was there for the first time two years ago, and I didn't make it last year, but really a nice area. There's some big scopes there. You can see the couple of the daubs set up. Um, quite the impressive um, place to go. Okay, so then I then I decided, this is kind of right around COVID, where people were spending a little more money on their homes and that. So I decided that I wanted to add something in my backyard to make it more convenient for me. Um, because those other pictures were just basically grass where I dug out and shoveled and I wanted a hard surface. Um, we always talked about having another building on our property for storage. But of course, I wanted to use it for astronomy. <laughs> and I actually did look at maybe getting a, a roll off roof put in. Um, but 
at the time, I couldn't really justify the cost of a roll-off roof because I my sky was somewhat limited in my backyard for, for, for open sky. There, I still had a very big tree, which you'll see in the next few slides what happened to that. But at the time, I just thought, you know, it's just too much money. And Tough Shed, they don't they won't modify to make an open roof. They said they won't touch that. So, so anyway, so I decided at least have a place to store my equipment. So I decided to have a 12 by 16 Tough Shed built. And then I added a stamp, stamp concrete patio, and then I added electricity. Um, I wasn't going to do electricity, or I thought, well, why not? Why, why not add electricity? Because I'm going to be using this a lot. And so here, here's the tough shed going up here, uh, up here, and then over on the, the upper right there. Um, that they're getting ready for the concrete. So I had the shed up on blocks, and then they poured the in the forms are here, and then I got a nice. Um, Stamp, stamp concrete um, patio um, out here. So it was quite an improvement, you know, our big, we have a big yard. It's like, let's just utilize this. I mean, for entertaining, for my astronomy, um, it, it just worked out really well. So I was pretty excited about that. I've been that for about two years now. And then here's some pictures in the winter with, with doing my, my, my path again, but you can see my shoveling it's a little bit easier now because I can get out there and I can shovel this. Um, this this winter was horrendous for snow. I mean, I was out there shoveling all the time. Unfortunately, because of the moisture, my concrete um, kind of budged up a little bit here, and I wasn't able to get my doors all the way open for the first time this winter. So I've got to get a planer, and I've got to plane off these doors because there was a little bit of movement. There's always that risk with that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, having a nice hard concrete surface in the wintertime, it, it's, it's great to have that. So I felt like I was really getting established. And then uh, inside, um, we had a un somewhat, un we had a partially finished basement, decided to finish the rest of the basements. And I wanted a room for me, the, I called the astronomy room. Um, this is where I remote in. Um, so I have, a, I have a, a mesh network in my house. I'm able to get a very strong connection out to my backyard. And um, also with COVID, um, I now work from home. It worked out, it was a good idea to do this just to, so I could have a nice office um, working from home. So, um, I mean, I even have a bed there to crash if I'm up late. I just don't want to go to bed, just, <laughs> just crash right there if I want. And then September, 2021, had already had the shed built and the concrete, and we had a huge storm. And the biggest tree in my back, uh, biggest tree in my backyard, went got taken out by a storm. And I'll never forget coming out that morning. I kind of had a smile on my face actually, because <laughs> I was kind of mixed. Like I hated missing that tree, but all of a sudden I had about forty percent of my sky open up. Just like this is going to be great. So um, hardest. We have a four season port, so it's hard to give up that tree because we know we have a lot more sun. But anyway, so um, so yeah, so that that winter was absolutely great because um, it was close to fall. I was able to get these images. I mean, I'm able to get all the more sky to get my images. So and then, um, like I mentioned earlier, with well, Minnesota winters, you know, they can really long and brutal. And you know, and then we got humidity haze, like I'm sure you guys do down in Tennessee. Um, but uh, so what I do now is I basically pull out my scope from the shed. I do a polar alignment, and then I retreat to the comfort of my home in my basement, so I don't have to sit outside anymore. And I, I use uh, VNC, um, kind of like RDP. Now, to remote into my laptop, which is running Nina on a small laptop. Um, I have now switched that, switched that to a Mele computer. So it's a very small computer. I don't actually use a laptop anymore. I just did that this winter. And then I have, I mentioned the mesh network. And then I also joined a service, which I'm, I'm sure your imagery is probably heard of. It's called Telescope Live. It allowed me to do remote imaging in winter places like the Southern Hemisphere that I'd never be able to get from where I live. 
And then uh, it also allows me to, to practice to pick insight to get better um, that I won't be able to get in the winter months of Minnesota. I get choice of the RGB, broadband, um, and the sub exposure lengths. And they also have sites in Chile and Spain. And then they have a telescope live site in Australia. And here's, here is the strip. This is the one down in Australia. Um, Heaven's Mayor, and this is the Etta Karina on the right hand side that I did a couple of years ago. So, uh, never imagined I'd be able to get that, but um, that's the magic of the internet, right? <laughs> they will do all that. Okay, so just kind of wanted to go about uh, what I have for equipment. Um, I have a stellar view, which I just purchased this winter. I haven't really seen any. First light with it just visually. It's a 102 APO refractor. Celestron 8 inch SCT, which is the original scope I started with a hobby. Um, I have a Celestron CPC 1100, which I, my plan is to, to defork that and put that on my CGX. Um, I really wasn't looking for that scope, but I there was a guy I met at a park and he really wanted to get rid of it and gave me such a good deal I couldn't resist. So. Um, I have my Lund solar scope, my original Celestron evolution mount. Um, I just purchased an AVX mount. Uh, I'm going to use that for my stellar view. And I really just, I don't want to have that, that, uh, that, uh, that really big uh, CGX mounts um, dragging that around remotely. So I want something with a lighter. In fact, I think I forgot to put that on my list here, but, but uh, then I got the star zone at, um, eight and 11 inch hyperstar. And then I have this star zone SCT reduced or corrector, which is great during galaxy season. And then um, these are my cameras that I use. And I just bought the 2600. I'm really impressed with that camera. Um, and then my original cameras that I had. I don't do monochrome. Um, only monochrome I do is stuff from Telescope Live. So, um, for one thing, Hyperstar is hard to do um, filters, but I could do with my stellar view, but that'll come later. And then on the left, this is this is the one I just bought. This one, this is my stellar view 102. Um, I'm just I just put the electronic focuser on it, Pegasus on it. Um, but like I said, the weather has not been friendly to us here, so I haven't actually added it out yet. And then uh, here's my my eight inch SCT um, with my Pegasus. Um, uh, power power box, PPADV power box. It serves as a power distribution and USB ports. And then there's my, I call it the Planet Killer, the CPC 1100. And then here's my solar skull that I have that I use in the summertime. Or, yeah, anytime actually when the sun is out. And then uh, here's just a list of the software I use. I, I, I mentioned I use Celestron CPWI Nina. Uh, APT, not so much anymore, but I still license for it. Star Tools, SharpCap Pro, PixInsight, Star Tools, Photoshop, and Affinity Photo. Now I want to go over a few of my memorable events um, that I encountered to do this, this short duration of, of, of this hobby for me. Um, Comet Neowise was incredible. Um, Comet Leonard, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, the transit of Mercury, multiple lunar eclipses, the Mars opposition in 2020. And here's Comet Leonard from my backyard and it was seven below that day. It was seven below Fahrenheit, and my focus are jammed. I, that's why my stars look funny there, but I only had about an hour to get this. I was pretty excited that I got this from my backyard. Um, comet processing is the challenge, I found out. And then um, down here, um, it was a very, very interesting story there. Um, it was cloudy all day, and I, I heard the forecast was like a sucker hole that just opened up for about an hour. So I ran to the down to the park that I mentioned earlier, and I was able to get, um, you know, Jupiter and Saturn um, 
very challenging because the brightness is our differences. Exposure had to be different, but um, that was pretty memorable. And then a, and then Comet Neowise over the North Dakota Badlands. And then there's my my uh, white light for my SCT, and then the transit of Mercury, just that black little dot there, um, right there, Mercury, in November of that year. Uh, Mars opposition, um, lunar eclipse, uh, May of 2022. And then just a few, few of my images um, that I've done over the years. That was one of the ones I feel are my better ones. You got the um, horse head and then the triangulum, the rosette, and then the boat galaxy. Andromeda would just barely fit um, in my hyperstar. Um, with my 2600, it'll be a better fit with the hyperstar. I'll be able to get the whole thing in and then and then Orion onto the right there. Running and the running man. Um, yeah, M13 and then Pleiades. This one I just finished. I just did this one and I had never done, uh, I had never used my IDAS NBC UHS filter. Um, it, there's been debates with, with the, with the uh, original uh, L-Extreme filter with Hyperstar was very disappointing. I heard there's a lot of halos around the stars, but um, using this IDAS NBC UHS filter um, worked out really nicely. So I, like I said, I did this this winter. So that's probably one of my, my most current ones. A lot, of, a lot of red in there because it's hydrogen alpha, you know. Um, I didn't use, you know, one shot color. So, and then this one, I just took this. This is down in on Telescope Lives. This is I I C forty six oh four. So it's part of of that uh, that cloud uh, nebula down in the southern hemisphere. It's R H O O P O P I. I can't really. I don't. Oh yeah, it's right up here. Opius right there. O P. Can't really pronounce that, but. Uh, this is six hours worth of data. Um, and I had a lot of credits built up and I decided, you know, start burning them up. So I took a six hour um, um, image of this. So, and then uh, last year in May of 2022, I took a trip out to California and that's where I found out about the, the TIC channel and I talked to them and then that's when they're looking for people to speak and that's where I got the idea to maybe do a presentation for the, for them because they're looking for speakers and that was really a good conference. I think they have that every other year. I don't know if they're going to have another one in 2024, but um, I love this area. I was down there before, so I made a trip down to Big Sur and the California coast south of San Francisco after the conference. It was really good. Um, very, very good conference. All, all the imagers were there. And uh, my future plans, I would like to get more involved in doing outreach once I retire. Um, I really want to get into landscape astrophotography. Um, we have a gentleman by the name of Mike Shaw, which you probably heard of, he lives in the Twin Cities. He, he, he is an expert at this and he has classes on it. And uh, I would like to get involved with doing more wide, really wide field stuff. So um, we've had a lot of, um, activity lately with the aurora borealis up here which I, I heard it was even down in the south too but um the sun is very active right now so i really would like to get into this more with the with the solar activity um and and uh, really peak in that activity and then um i have this on here this is um i did do this last summer i can't i i, I use nina and i use a framing assistance and i did a mosaic I'm with my hyperstar, and I, I have six panels to stitch together that will include the entire Veil Nebula, but I haven't gotten around to working on that yet. And then uh, retire soon so I can focus on astronomy. I, I think this hobbies, there's so much here that I, I will not be bored. So um, I think this is the year I'm going to retire. I think it'll be this this year. It'll be for, before January for sure, but I won't be working until 2024. And then, uh, yeah, this is just this is a picture of my shed and what it looks like in the summer. And I, I added a little uh, weather station up the top here last year. 
So I have all, my own little Tempest weather system on my shed. So uh, any questions? Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. I have hey. a question. Uh -huh. uh, so your uh, Lant Solar uh, Telescope, are you using, which blocking filter are you using? The I'm using the, the 1200. I'm using the 1200. Okay. And yeah. which camera? Excuse me? Which camera were you using with that? I'm using the 174 monochrome. Is that that's 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 is it a ZWO camera? It is a ZWO camera. Okay. Yeah, yeah and uh, uh, the people at Lund recommended, especially with doing imaging, to have the B1200 okay. um, blocking filter. So yeah, that's what I use for it. So, and I, I, you know, for 60 millimeter, I'm really impressed with it. I mean, it's got the pressure tuner on it. Right. So I, I, can, I can crank it all the way up and get the nice prominences to come out. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun little scope. Still I need to look at uh, my camera and see what the chip size is going to result in image uh, from that. But uh, I'm looking at that very same telescope. Oh, okay, yeah. And and Lunt now has decided to make them multi scopes. Yeah, a lot of people don't like because they said why they just stick to solar scopes. But it's a modular concept now, so you can take out the you can take out the HA and then make it a a refractor, but you know, I thought that'd be really cool. But I got my new Stellar View, so I'm going to use that for my refractor. You know, right? That's right. going to be the beauty. But yeah, I'll, I had a friend that just said a lot. He loves solar, and he and he went to London. He said, he says, why why don't you just sell, you know, just a hydrogen alpha? Why do you need to mix these other scopes up? And they actually found an old one. They sold it to him, but uh, some people don't like that change. But I think they're trying to be, trying to be competitive. You know, hey, they got to make a living, <laughs> right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, thank you. Excellent You're presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Beautiful pictures, beautiful observatory, and uh, I'm envious of your uh, backyard there, especially. Yeah, with the it's, it's amazing. We lived here 35 years, and. <laughs> and we had nothing in our backyard. So during COVID, we just transitioned it. And, you know, on this planter here, right here where this the umbrella here. So just the other direction was with, the, with that big tree. You see where I reseeded all this. That's where that tree was. Wow. So that tree, that tree opened up the entire eastern sky, which well, everything I rises in the east. So. Picnic table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's amazing. My my sky is just totally opened up to the east, and like I said, I I was kind of excited, but sad in a way. But sure. I won't be in any hurry planting a tree there. I mean, I'll plant it for the next people that live here. <laughs> okay, Kit Peak. That's yeah. a, that's a fascinating trip. Um, can you tell me more? about the the tour of that observatory and did you have to schedule that ahead of time how did that exactly work yes you do you you they they have um we did schedule ahead of time because it's very it's very high demand and uh they had the one program where they served you a lunch and it was like a hundred bucks and they took you to one of their observatories and they let you um, feel the, you know, the dome rotating, you know, the whole thing rotated. Um, then they had the real expensive option was almost like a sleepover. That was $300. But you spent the entire night there, pretty much. They let you, and they let you do like four different telescopes and they, they, they let you watch the imagers and everything. So that's the extensive program. That is in really high demand. It's very hard to get into. Um, but you can go out to their site. I mean, they're, since COVID uh, has waned, they've opened that up again now. But we opted just for like an evening from like from seven to like midnight, you know. And uh, they're very serious about their light pollution down in Tucson. I mean, they they made sure that they had people directing you out of Kitt Peak and you had your headlights off. They had guys with these 
the red flashlights, you know, you know, directing you out. Um, they, they are very serious about that. But like I said, I I have never seen so many stars in my life. And I grew up in North Dakota, never really appreciated the night sky when I was younger. But I go back there now and it's like, I can't believe I didn't do this when I was younger, you know. I probably didn't have the money to do it, you know, because it's and telescopes weren't that popular back then, you know. But uh, yeah, Kitt Peak is amazing. It's 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 really a cool trip. How and, far in advance did you have to schedule? Um, I think I scheduled like a month or two in advance, and so I knew we were going to go to Tucson, and so we scheduled. We got the tickets, um, and uh, you know, like the primary visit was to actually go down and spend some time with Star Zona. Um, they're really good people. I've become really good friends with them. And, um, you know, that was that was a primary reason. But I thought, if I'm going down to Tucson, I'm going to go check out a few observatories. And, you know, there's there's Mount Lemon, too, which is supposed to be pretty cool, too. Yeah. You know, but uh, that, that, was, that was an awesome trip. Yeah, Lowell Observatory is another one. Um... Just because of the historical significance, so have you thought about that one? I have thought about that one. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to go to. Lock. I'd like to. Uh, you know, they have these. Uh, you see them in the Sky and Telescope or these tours. I would love to go on and just go on a a tour with my bring my wife with us. Let's just go visit all these observatories. You know, and uh, I would like to do that someday. I have reservations for a night uh, of the McDonald Observatory in Texas for my son and I. And uh, the entire summer season when they open it up to public use like that uh, is like, they got like a two week window when they first open up those reservations where you stand a chance of getting a reservation. And we had, and it's like in April when it opens up. And I got online and got that done and had reservations in like uh, June or July, I forget which was, but something came up and we had to cancel, which just broke my heart. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the Kitt Peak is, is, is uh, it's like about an hour from Tucson, but you're almost in Mexico. It's very close to Mexico. In fact, it's on an Indian reservation. So, yeah. But my son was at Laughlin Air Force Base, which is on the border with Mexico and Texas. And I thought I'd just go down, visit him, pick him up, and drive up to McDonald, which was a little further west uh, from where he was. And mm -hmm. that was going to be fun. But he wound up being having to be in um, not Cleveland, but uh, Columbus, Ohio, I guess, or wherever the main Air Force base was. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, tell me more about this event in August that you guys do. It's a one week kind of star party. It is. Yep. It's up at, uh, it's up at a town called McGregor, Minnesota. And it's a portal to sky. And we probably have about 300 people that come up there. Um, the Green Bay, Wisconsin club is very active. Um, they come to it. They come over from Green Bay. Um, and we, we, I've made a lot of friends from the Green Bay Club too. So, um, yeah, they, we all come up. And what's really slick about this place is that it's a conservation center. So it's, it's, it's for people that love the outdoors. So they have bunks. So you can rent rooms for like $20, $30 a night. And you can share bunks. You can get your own room. You can share with other people. They have a cafeteria there. I mean, it's, it's just this, this this perfect place. And they have this open field. And some people bring their campers. And um, a lot of people just stay. They just they stay in these these bunk houses. And the place is extremely dark at night. I was there for the first time. I didn't know my way around. I got freaking lost. I had to, you know, and they, and they don't want you to turn your lights on anywhere. People com will complain at you. So you know, I'm got with a red light trying to find my way around this place. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I had just come really late. And I didn't know the place very well. So it took me a while to get uh, orientated because it's very, very dark there. And, um, 
Yeah, it's it's a big deal. Um, we get, uh, I don't know if you guys know Bob King. He writes for the, the Duluth newspaper in Duluth, Minnesota. He's yeah. there. He does a, a lot of the Aurora, Aurora Borealis stuff. That's Bob King. He's in our club. Oh, and wow. he, he, he comes up there and he brings his stuff. And it's just some really cool people that come to that every year. So what are some of the biggest telescopes that you've seen there? Oh boy, I, I wish I knew my if I knew visual um, better. I know that you, if you if you saw my pictures, if you remember my on slide, there there were some um, there were some really really big Dobsonians there. I mean, the, I mean they had one. I mean, you have to crawl up a huge ladder to get to 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 get to the view it. I don't know how big it is. I I don't know the numbers. I should go look that one up, but. It's very large. I guess you got to take a ladder to crawl up to the top to it. Um, and and then we have a we have a garage where we store those in. You know, a big garage. They're they're so big. So. So the observatory you showed with the roll off roof and the the warming house. I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. You have a obviously you're going to need that a warming center or a warming house in in Minnesota. Um, What's your procedure for allowing people to have access to that site? Do they have to schedule it, sign in? Is it a go and, and, and view? How does that work? That's a good question. I should mention that we have a system called a key holder. So um, the key holder needs to come down for training. So they need to come down and they need to have training on opening and closing the warm house. And then that observatory those telescopes, if you want to image using those telescopes, you have to be trained on them. I'm one of the trainers. So I, the last few years, I've been holding sessions and training people on using the Takahashi and the plane wave. Um, and so you have to understand how to roll the roof off. We have a security system built into the, you know, you have to enter a code in. Um, so um, with COVID, um, we started a process where we have to tell on our mass form, we have to reserve. We have to say, we're gonna go down there. We're gonna reserve it. And it's be, it's mostly because of COVID. And since even though COVID is waning, we decided to keep that in place. Um, the guys that are in our club, the webmasters are just whizzes. They are setting up as we speak an online reservation system. So um, you'll have to go out and say, you're gonna go down there. And so you have to go in and you have to reserve and say, you're gonna be down there. I mean, anybody can use it, but you have to be a key holder to use it. So we have we have real expensive equipment at our sites, and we we just don't let anybody in there to operate these this equipment until they're trained on it. If they want to get trained on it, you have a plane wave. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We we have a we have a a, a very very. Uh, a, a, a benefactor who's very generous. Um, we're very lucky to have him. You know, that was getting, that was my next question. Funding? How did you get that built? And <laughs> well, you the the observatories you saw those are all a lot of from him. I mean, it's his contribution. He loves the hobby, and he's uh, in fact I didn't know for years who he was. You Would know, you mind giving him my cell phone number? I'd like to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. uh, that's a nice perk to have. All you it need really is, is. Like that, huh? yeah, it really is because I mean, you know that that stuff's expensive. I mean, this is expensive stuff, but he, uh, I think he uses it for a write-off. I think it helps him. You know, he's 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 had a very successful life, and uh, it's good taxing for him. It's it's deductible, tax deductible. Mm -hmm. You know, so probably a rounding error for him. It's tax to yeah, yeah. It's tax write off. Yeah. Yeah, probably is. So yeah, we're we're very lucky. We're, you know, it's it's a great organization. I'm I'm so proud to be part of it. I mean, and, and part of this organization. And uh I there's no way, there's no way I would be where I was today if it wasn't for this organization. Because I there, there's so many good imagers in the club that um I, I would have been struggling. I would have been struggling big time. You know, and then and then finding out that, you know, the guy in my club was a meteorologist i opened the newspaper and he's writing an article in the paper and now now he's been coming over coming over here and asking me for some help with with nina so 
he doesn't live far from me now. So now I'm now I'm um, helping other people. Yeah. You know, they help me. I'm helping them now. And that's what I like to do. I like to help other people succeed, you know. Yeah, I was tremendous progress here in the last five or six years since you got in this hobby. Yeah. And it's, it's, and I work, and I work, um, I work in a very, I work in IT and I work in a very stressful job. So, um, you know, I've been doing this for 45 years. And I just, I, I like my job. It's just that it's time that I really want to focus on me now, me time. And so I've got, I've got the equipment now, um, everything that I need pretty much. Um, now it's time to sit back and, and, and really enjoy this hobby. So perfect timing for me. Just going to give a second here, see if anybody has any other questions. Yes. Yeah, so how did Egan, Minnesota get to be a, a major data center? We One of our biggest data centers is in Egan. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, yeah, Egan is um, is very kind to big companies. I mean, we have, uh, if you heard of West Publishing, we're, we're West Law Publishing. We have the headquarters there in Egan. The Minnesota Vikings, um, new headquarters is in Egan. Um, we have, IBM has got a big presence here. So, yeah, I don't know. We're, I think it's because we're, we're really centrally located uh, to, between Minneapolis and St. Paul, and we're very close to the airport. So I, I think that has a lot to do with it. You ever so, heard of the United States Postal Service? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the BMC is about five miles from my house. Okay. <laughs> the BMC, the, the bulk mail center. And believe yeah. it or not, I worked in direct mail for years before I got into the bank. I, I did. I worked very closely with the United States Post Office with with bulk mail centers and, and writing software for them. So you work for the post office then? I work for a company that contracts with them. We do software development. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, big data center. I don't think they have mainframes anymore. I'm not sure, but I, they might still have mainframes, but uh no. Well not there. We have uh uh we're retiring our supercomputers, the SG, uh, SGI, uh, we're retiring the 4,000s now and going in with uh, a whole lot of uh, HP okay. computer systems. You know, HP. Yeah. Well, you heard of Cray Research, right? Everybody that the mainframe. Right. So Cray Research is in, was based in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, which is about two hours from here. Uh, Cray Research also had a very big presence in Egan. Oh, okay. So in Egan. I probably yeah. got started there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So no, And, and uh, Unisys was big in Egan. So mm -hmm. Delta Airlines used to be in Egan. Then now Delta moved their headquarters to Atlanta, as you guys know. So yeah, you're right. Egan is was just a draw for corporate. Um, but with all the, with everything changing, with people working from home, Everybody's downsizing now. There's places moving out now. So it's like, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, after two years, two and a half years of working from home, we've, we're going into the office one and two days a week, and that's it. And yeah, I'm not even sure why we're doing that, I guess, because it's a federal building and they got it paid, it's paid for anyway. So, <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Like I said, I work from home full time now. I'm home based uh, since COVID and I I really like it. I I I'm you know, I've got my astronomy down here, I've got my work down here. It's work, works out perfect for me. And uh I love my new setup. I mean, I I I dreamed of someday of, you know, this this is a tough place to live. I'm telling you, winters are long here. And to be able to come inside here and get my stuff set up and come in my basement and just watch my stuff run is, is so nice. You know, otherwise, you know, it, it's our season's very short here. It's humid in the summertime and um, it's not the best place for, for uh, astrophotography. I mean, I don't know what Memphis is like, but. Our season's short too. It's called the few cloudless days a year that we get. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. We get a lot of clouds. Okay, you do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been to Nashville, but I've never been to Memphis. So 
Um, Chattanooga, I've been to Chattanooga, Nashville, whole place. What did you guys do for the fifth barbecue? Year? You need to come to Memphis. That sounds great. <laughs> come to Memphis. We'll take you out for, for Southern barbecue. Absolutely. Yeah, we went to Dickie's the other night, and I absolutely hated it. I was the worst ever. <laughs> Dickie's is not barbecue. <laughs> no. We got we to gotta get this guy into some, some of these backwoods, hole-in-the-wall barbecue places where they, where they take pride in their ribs. Yeah. I had a I had a friend, very close friend of mine in the astronomy club, um, move from Minnesota to Dallas. He's in Dallas now. Um, you know, he he just it was a political thing. He just wanted to move to the south. And uh he has invited me down to Dallas for the solar eclipse. So I'm really excited about that. Nice. And he's gonna have a barbecue in his backyard. And uh, of course. <laughs> yeah. And he he told me he said he said you're with me he says wherever I he's in the he's in the Fort Worth club he's in like three different clubs the Fort Worth club is one of them and he says you're with me so wherever I go you can come with me so it was nice of him to offer that for me so that is nice yeah yeah because the thing with the eclipse of course is I don't care where you live or what you got set up uh, but it's a last minute go get where the clouds are not yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I, I can't, just can't imagine that the frenzy. That <laughs> yeah. oh, about the week before the eclipse, you know, we were last uh, the last time we were calculating and ruminating and trying to figure out where we were going to go and what the weather was going to do and what the chances of this or that. And yeah, overall, it came out all right. I don't think many of us missed it, so. Yeah, well, they tell me that Texas, for the most part, is is pretty good chance of, of clear sky. They, they have best chance of clear skies, you know, the first south. So, yeah. But, but springtime in the south is a crapshoot. Is it really? Okay, yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're in Tornado Alley and everything else. So Yeah, and same here. Same here right now, right? Tornadoes, hail. Um, yeah, it's the same thing here. No different. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to ask you, you had your 50th anniversary a year ago. We got our 70th coming up in the fall. What did oh, you get to do for the 50th? What did we do? Yeah. What, what, what did you, yeah. Did you have anything special planned? I mean, did, what did you guys we do? Did. We did. We went out to our premier site, the premier site I showed you on those slides. And we had, um, oh, I, I just remembered his name, Chuck Allen. Um, from the uh, what's the organization that uh, we're part of, and you guys are sure are part of too. Um, it's the um, no, the, the 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 organization that has the Reflector magazine. Um, Chuck Allen. Okay. Um, I can't I, I can't believe I think of his name, but if you're you're part. If you have a club, you're part of them. You're part of them, and you have to pay them. I think so many. Like like a hundred bucks a year to be part of their 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 um their firm. Anyway, we had him come and speak. We had him come and speak at our our and we had kind of a party and we had cake and everything. So it was kind of cool. Nice. And uh, and to get him to come up, and we had a, a Pamela Gray. Yeah. Yeah, I think she was From, there. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. She's uh, she and Frazier have done that podcast for years. Right. So we had them. Um, unfortunately, I was out of town and I couldn't make the party. But uh, yeah, we did that. It was in October of last year, I believe. And uh, yeah, we had a little thing going on. We had a at our premiere site. Um, nice. You know, showed all those domes, the ash dome, and all that. So yeah, so we did celebrate that and. Uh, hmm. And of course, we had Alcon in 2018, which I was just getting into it then, but that was a cool thing, too. Are you talking about the American Astronomical Society, AIES? I think so. Or is I, it just, nice I just Googled and it, it says this, check Allen's with the Astronomical League. Oh, the There's, Astronomical League, okay. Astronomical yeah. League, right. And you, you guys should be part of that because you're you have a club no, right we're not 
Oh, you're not. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Never, never saw fit to pay the annual membership fee. Oh, that's what it is. I, I knew there was a fee involved, but uh, with my membership, um, I get that magazine uh, from them. You know, it's right. included. But uh, okay, I thought everybody was part of it. But yeah. Anyway, yeah, he was yeah. a speaker. But we have some pretty cool speakers. We had our meeting last night. And we had a guy from uh, Iowa talk about Venus. That was pretty cool. So um, we have a guy that in our club that has contacts from a lot of these different uh, people that, uh, and, they, and the University of Minnesota is very active in astronomy, as you know. And so we get a lot of speakers from the University of Minnesota to speak at our meetings too. So some of them are way over my head, you know, other ones, you know, they're like Venus was pretty interesting last night, you know. Um, but we meet once a month, um, first Thursday of the month, and uh, the good group of people. So you had your meeting last night. We did. Excellent. Yeah, and that's why meetings in person, virtual. How do you guys do it? Um, well, we used to have like at least a hundred people in every that first Thursday a month. Well, then COVID hit, and we all went remote, and we did. The building we met in, um, they tore it down and we didn't have a place to go. So they built a new building there and we worked with the city and now it's a brand new building. But we probably get about 30 people now um, on site and probably about another 100 online. But we over we have over 600, 650 people in the club. So um, but we we're, we we're trying to promote more people coming back in person because we missed out that we miss that, you know, togetherness and, and then going out for like a beer afterwards. Um, so I try to go, it's about a half hour from my house. I try to go um, in person um, when I can. Plus I'm on the board, so I like to be there. Um, but yeah, most people have gotten really used to just sitting at home, you know, and just in the comfort of their home and dialing in. And um, so we, we do a little bit of both, but most of it's still online yet i think the covid stuff has sank in you know yeah to a lot of people's. yeah we went virtual for a couple of years too and then last year we got back to in person and we've been kind of hybrid for the past year and uh, we've been doing a mix of in person and virtual and kind of taking it month by month and there is something nice about you know being in the comfort of your home but it's there, there's also something nice about getting out once in a while and actually see it being so exactly yeah and then you know with our star parties we suffered you know for those years where you know masks were mandatory our observatories masks were were, were mandated we had to if you know more no more than two people in the observatory you had to have a mask on so um you know um but that's that's kind of waned a little bit now but yeah it was a it was a tough three years and uh I mean, like I said, this project that you're looking at with this backyard, I, if it wasn't for COVID, I don't know if I ever did it because people were spending money during COVID, right? People are saying, well, 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 I can't do anything. What can I do? So that's we decided to do this backyard thing and, um, you know, finish my basement because you couldn't do anything else, right? You're stuck at home. Yeah. And, you know, use, utilize what you have. And uh, it, it's worked out very well for, for me. I'm very happy with it. Yeah, it's a nice setup. I mean, COVID really forced us to adapt and add that extra dimension. So ironically, a lot of us, I think a lot of clubs have come out of this more versatile in terms of their, their yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So going forward, what club wise, what are some of your goals? What are some of the things you guys are looking to accomplish? Well, we're, our membership is growing, and so, um, you know, more and more outreach, you know, people are, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to reach out more to the parks. I, I'm working with the county across the road here to try to get into the park more, and, and uh, we're just trying to spread the word more. I mean, that's, that's kind of our goal to, you know, we're, we're, we're really involved with the community. I mean, we, there's a couple of observatories in the Twin Cities that, you know, one of my friends is he's very involved in getting them set up. So we're constantly trying to help, you know, places kind of like what you guys are doing, you know, get everybody involved and 
you know, getting the word out, um, high schools or astronomy programs. Yeah. You know, just like, just like most clubs are doing. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah, we have three universities in town. We have the University of Memphis, which now has an astrophysics program. Rhodes College, where we meet, they have an astronomy club. And then Christian Brothers, where we used to meet, all within a few miles of each other. So we've, we've got that, that part of it. And then trying to reach the youth more. Um, Same with us. Libraries or schools, right? Yeah, exactly. That's one of our goals, yeah. Yeah, and then, of course, any... Well, the Scouts, too, the, the Boy Scouts and the Cub Scouts, those have been some pretty popular outreach events. It's like herding cats with, with little kids, but you always get a few that look through the eyepiece and they're just blown away. By they are. Doing. Yeah, they are. So you guys, did, do you have a mixture of uh, visual and imagers? More imagers, more visual, or what do you have kind of in your group? It's a mix. I'm a visual guy. We have an astrophotography group. Merrill heads that, and they've really grown and made tremendous strides. Rick started it a couple of years ago, and Merrill's kind of taken over it now. He's the reason why you're here. And oh, okay. Yeah, those guys, have, they meet once a month, and it's just, you know, hardcore astrophotography. You know, they, 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 they talked about Nina, and I I know nothing about it, but uh, they talked about that in the last meeting, and we got okay. some other guys that dabble. So you actually have a separate meeting for the imagers then? Yes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we've never done that. We have a lot of imagers in our club, but uh, wow. but we but we do. You know, you that sh you saw that once that with that um, that um, that building where we have our classroom. Um, we do have, um, we do schedule imaging sessions throughout the year, like we'll probably have one in August. Well, the imagery will just come in. Um, if you heard of Mike Shaw, um, who's the, 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 that, the landscape aspirator from the Twin Cities, um, he gives presentations out there. Um, so we do have uh, impromptu classes that we do, um, and we'll try to learn from each other. That's how I learn. Yeah. So that peer collaboration, right? That's the best way to learn. That is the best way to learn. And that's that's why I joined because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. You know? You're a landscape astrophotographer. One more time. What's his name? Mike Shaw. Mike Shaw. Are any of his presentations on your channel? Um he's an active member in our club, but if you if you Google Mike Shaw for uh, astrophotography, he just came out with a new book. And I just bought it. Um, he 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 has um, phenomenal pictures. He he goes like to Yosemite, um, Palm Deserts. I mean, he he has these sessions. You can go on these trips with him, and he will teach you how to do landscape astrophotography. So, uh, uh, and he he's in our club. He's very active. He used to be a doctor. He's Doctor Mike Shaw, um, but he's got some great books on astrophotography, um, you know, more of the wide field DSLR stuff. And uh, that's one area I haven't tackled yet, but that's the one thing I have left that I want to learn. Yeah, know. that does look interesting to me personally. Lower yeah. Range, right? Yeah, because in Northern Minnesota, and then, you know, I mentioned Bob King, who lives in Duluth, um, you know, we live in a gem for Aurora Borealis, I mean, Northern Minnesota. You know, it's phenomenal. And with the active solar cycle, it's only yeah. going to get better. Yeah. Have you seen them, by the way? I have never seen one. I On the 23rd, I have a um, Aurora Pro on my phone, and I have it set up to, to issue a siren. Uh -huh. And that Sunday night, I heard a siren. And I thought, what? And this never happens in the Twin Cities. And I went out, and it was cloudy. But just north of the cities, they had phenomenal. I mean, I saw pictures from Oklahoma and Texas. People are taking from the Aurora. Aurora was that strong. It was going that far south. So, wow. Yeah, I mean, that, that is unheard of, you know, to see Arizona, they were getting pictures. Um, but, yeah, this, this solar cycle is crazy right now, and it's only going to get better. So if you want to get into Aurora Borealis stuff, Now's the time, huh? Now's the time. And big trips. I mean, Canada, you know, 
Alaska, they, they get them all the time. Yeah. But, you know, Minnesota, we're pretty far north, so we can get them here, but I haven't seen one yet. I want to see it. <laughs> yeah. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You'll exactly. see that soon. It's like the solar thing. You're chasing it. You're chasing. Yeah. You're chasing, you know, something. Right. Yeah. So. Fascinating. Anybody have any other questions? We got to. We got to let him go. I don't know. Is your wife okay with this hobby? I mean, it, it goes both ways. Is it she, really effective? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, she supports me 100%. I mean, she thinks I'm nuts when I come home at three in the morning. What else? I got to work. Doing? And I got to work at eight, you know, and, and uh, I, I'm getting kind of old for that. It's hard on your body when you got, you, you know, so she's going to go, she's going to Hawaii for two weeks with her, her sister and her nieces on the 13th. She'll be gone for two weeks. <laughs> I told my friend last night, and he goes, how do you schedule that over new moon? New moon. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, if I'm praying to God that I have clear skies because I mean, she doesn't care what I do. Right. So, but I will go down to our cherry Grove place and I'll just sleep in my car. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just, you know, if it's, if it's going to be nice weather, I will stay down there for a couple of days. I have Wi-Fi down there. I can work from there if I want. Wow. That's yeah. Crazy. So I put Wi-Fi in there. So yeah. So she's fine with it. She totally supports me. She loves my images you know, she thinks, well, you should sell them. It's like, well, everybody does. It. It's not a big deal. I mean, I can be kind of modest, but, I, you know, I do it because I enjoy it. I think, yeah. that she, you know, the beauty of the images and stuff. So, yeah, she's totally on board. And uh, I got her to go to the solar eclipse and be done in Dallas next year. So that's a that's a breakthrough. So cool. That'll yeah. be a nice trip for you guys, man. I hope I hope the weather cooperates. Yeah, be great. And of course, I'll be driving because I'm going to bring my scope with. So maybe a couple of my scopes. So, right. So, well, that's good. Well, look us up sometime. We'd love I to will. Meet in person. Yeah, that would be cool if I ever get down to, um, like I said, I love Nashville. I love country music. I know Memphis has got blues, but um, someday maybe, you know, I'll look you guys up. Yeah, definitely. If you come up here, if you come up to the up to Twin Cities you know, look me up. We may take you up on that. Um, it's, it's the, the hobby is mobile. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of places to go, a lot of trips to take. So there I'm is to check out your, your, your site, your dark sky site. Yeah. You would, you would love it. I mean, with you being visual, oh my God, you would love it. There's a lot of big dobs there. There's like four or five of them. They bring them out and they are big. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I would love to look through one of those sometimes. So yeah. Yeah. I may come up there and pay you a visit maybe in August. Okay. I so. think it's like August 13th. Let's see. I look at my calendar here. I think I've written on the calendar already here. It's, um, it's 16th to 20th. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 16th to 20th. New moon. So, cool. yeah. I mean, you have to, you have to, um, you know, you have to get a reservation because you're going to stay there. Then there's, there's lodging there and that. But, uh, yeah. We have the Green Bay folks come up, come up, and they love it. So nice. You a Vikings fan? Um, not really. Well, I don't know. We we uh, Twins fans for sure because at least we're, we're in the World Series. But uh, we're having a tough here. The Wild just get just got knocked out of the first hockey playoffs, and the Vikings just um, I don't know. I. I and not much anymore. I've kind of ever since Gary Anderson missed that field goal against Atlanta, that was the end of it for me. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that game? <laughs> yeah, no. A play like that'll kind of make your brain dead on the on the on the sport, on the team. Or the or the Blair, the Blair Witch thing where he missed those field goals, our kicker. Do you remember <laughs> that one too? <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Well, listen, we'll let you go. It's uh, coming up on nine o'clock here. Really appreciate your time again. Excellent presentation. Thank you. you. Got anything else you want to say? No, uh, thanks for joining in. And I, I really, uh, I really enjoyed doing this for you guys. So. Yeah. Thanks again. Looking forward to further collaboration and seeing more of the images and hopefully we'll see you at a future astronomy event. Okay. See you guys. Thank you. All right. Yep. Bye-bye.
We're Bye. done, guys. Remember, tomorrow night, Pinecrest, if it's clear, stay tuned to your uh, email. And um, Burton's in two weeks and Bobby Lanier in two weeks. So let's hope for clear skies as we get into the month of May. And our next meeting is June the 2nd. Mark your calendars, Rhodes College. Got Dr. Dr. Daniel Barth coming in. So with that, we'll sign off. Thanks for joining in and we'll see you guys soon. Have a good night.